Hello, everyone. This is Sonia Bashir Kabir from SBK Tech Ventures. I'm super excited to welcome you to our new normal Zoom webinar on fintech opportunities in a less contact world. Today, we have a great lineup of panelists and only 60 minutes, so I'm going to take you to them right away. First of all, we've got Smita Agarwal. She is the Global Investments Advisor for Flourish Ventures. She's a pioneer on digital banking and financial inclusion. She advises flourish on investment strategies and policy engagements that help advance financial health inclusion in Asia. Last but not least, Smita is a friend of the Bangladeshi startup community. She sits on the board of a Bangladeshi startup called Shop Up, and she has visited Bangladesh many times. Her last visit was with the Queen of Maxima of Netherlands, where she moderated a session on fintech. I'm also very, very excited to welcome you, Smita. Next, we have Tillman Erbeck. He's a managing partner of Flourish Ventures. He co-manages Flourish and globally works with purpose-driven founders, investing in actionable ideas that help people improve their economic prospects and financial lives. He currently serves as the chair of the Advisory Council of the United Nations Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance in Development. Tillman, super excited to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you for having me. And last but not least, we've got Todd Schweitzer. He's CEO and founder at Brankus. Brankus is a premier financial software and solutions provider in Southeast Asia, providing large scaling payment transaction and cash management systems for e-commerce, SMEs, Fortune 100, 500, and ASEAN 50 companies. Thank you so much for joining us, Todd. Pleasure to have you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thanks, everyone. Super exciting. So we're going to have the uh, panel in three segments. So begin, we'll begin with a macro view and a macro view on fintech. And we'll go over to Tillman first to define fintech and the relevance of fintech in, in you know, how it's changed in the wake of the current global pandemic um, environment. Tillman, over to you. Well, listen, thank you. Thank you for, for having me. So. Thank, thank you for asking the, the what is fintech question, right? Financial services have, of course, always used um, uh, technology in the back end. So that's not new. But what is new and what has had us excited um, <clears throat> over the last five, 10 years is the new opportunities at the customer interface, in particular, riding on the mobile phone. So there are new services and products uh, possible, there's different distribution possible, there's better engagement possible <clears throat> at lower cost. So that's all great. And in addition, um, there's a whole new host of data available in, in the FinTech world that we are excited about that allows for new ways of underwriting credit, for new ways of, under, uh, of, uh, of underwriting insurance, and I can come back to that later. But that's the fintech that we are excited about. And the reality is, from a very high level, 10,000 feet perspective, the, the pandemic, the move to a less touch economy, has frankly accelerated what we were already excited about. Right? More people need to be online. So that's most obvious in payments and these type of things. There are obviously different needs, travel insurance, is not so important when you can't travel, but critical illness insurance is. Um, <clears throat> but all in all, the pandemic, which is a challenging situation, and there is a human tragedy element, obviously, to it, for our work in trying to help more people with their financial lives, it is accelerating things that are actually helpful. And we have permanent capital. We are very committed to this space uh, in the long run, including to Bangladesh. Thank you very much. We'll come back to you because I'm sure um, that you've said a few important things that will come back. Uh, but keeping at the macro level, I'm going to go ask Smita, what do you see as opportunities for Bangladesh, Smita, in the fintech space? So thank you, Sonia. As you said, I have been, you know, um, um, tracking Bangladesh for over a decade since my first visit there. And every time I come to Bangladesh, I find it to be a very high energy environment. There are lots of good things going on in Bangladesh that puts it 
Bangladesh in a very unique position. Number one is, of course, your GDP growth rate. You continue to be amongst the fastest growing economies in Asia and also relative to the world. Um, the second thing is the entire digitization, the entire adoption of mobile and internet. Uh, uh, um, you know, uh, that is taken off so dramatically. And what's more interesting is people are not just using internet or the social media like Facebook to talk to each other and for entertainment. There is business going on. There is commerce going on. Uh, so it's actually turning out to be a huge source of livelihood and income generation. So there are the consumers have actually uh, adapted to digital uh, you know, much better than I have seen in many other emerging markets. Um, the third thing is the entire focus uh, through the digital Bangladesh initiatives. And you know, even in the context of the current pandemic, you know, the digital tech first initiatives like the contact tracing app or the crowdfunding platform that has been put together uh, um, has actually uh, uh, brought focus much much more on digital, uh, both from a policy standpoint, from a consumer adoption and behavior standpoint. People are far more comfortable uh, doing transactions online, ordering their groceries, and you know, even moving to education online or health consultations online. Um, so these are all really going very well. I think the big gap that I continue to see in Bangladesh is you still, while you have almost 100% uh, mobile coverage and a very large proportion of uh, uh, people accessing internet regularly, you still have more than half the population who have never used a bank account or a banking service. Uh, you still have a very large proportion of people who don't don't have access to credit uh, uh, from any formal financial institution. And that, I think, is the big uh, opportunity in Bangladesh today for introducing digital financial services that could be accessible and affordable to all. Uh, FinTech actually allows uh, new business models that can bring down costs dramatically, that can create unprecedented reach. Um, just specifically talking about two opportunities, I would say, see, on the payment side, Bangladesh has been a pioneer and you have mobile financial service players uh, like Bcash and Nogad who have transformed the entire P2P payments. Uh, but there's a big opportunity in digitizing person to merchant payments and business to business payments, uh, which are predominantly continue to be in cash today. The other big opportunity is digital credit. You know, I would say that there is this whole missing middle uh, um, uh, that is there, that customers that are too big for the MFIs and too small for the banks and, and BFIs to deal with. And these are people who don't have, have any history of borrowing before, but are very economically active and would benefit by a working capital credit or a line of credit to be able to grow their business. And that these are the kind of opportunities that FinTech can tap into and create a, 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 you know, a have a thriving ecosystem which can make sure that every single uh, um, um, individual in Bangladesh can actually tap into these services. I, I would just like to add just one more point. I think being a late entrant for Bangladesh could also be an advantage. You can actually leapfrog several generations of innovations, um, benefit from the learnings from other markets, and jump straight into the latest innovation and the best innovation. One good example could be, though most of the banks in Bangladesh are not digitized or may not have a mobile banking app or internet banking, there is an opportunity for them to leapfrog straight into open banking or API banking where you can move to an era where banking services do not need to be offered only through bank owned channels, but can actually be embedded in consumer experiences where the consumers are. Similarly, Bangladesh can completely leapfrog the card-based uh, uh, um, uh, uh, payments and move straight into QR code-based or app-based payments, which would be more efficient and cheaper to do. So I think the big opportunity in Bangladesh today is to have a thriving ecosystem of fintech, which comprises not just of startups, but also banks, NBFIs, MFIs, everybody collaborating in making sure that there is easy access to financial services for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. You've given some very good points. We will come back to that while continuing on the 
macro. Um, over to you, Todd. My question is that financial services are, are part of a very regulated industry and banks play a very important role here. How can the banking sector transform and embrace um, FinTech or the digital transformation that FinTech is bringing? If you can share your thoughts on that. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you, Sonia. And, and I, I, uh, I share certainly Smitha and, and Tillman's uh, point of view about kind of the excitement in FinTech now and particularly in a market like Bangladesh. Uh, so Brancas is, is in Southeast Asia primarily. Uh, I'm based in Manila, Philippines, and, and a lot of our financial services infrastructure in the Philippines is, is somewhat similar to Bangladesh, right? More than 50% also unbanked. And I think that the, you know, the incumbent financial services industry is, um, you know, I think it's safe to say has not been very customer friendly, not been very consumer friendly, which is to say that, you know, in a regulated industry, it, innovation is slow, there's a real risk avoidance, but now I think, especially with, with Bangladesh's neighbors um, and seeing all the innovation that's taken place in the peer-to-peer -peer wallet and consumer finance, I think customers are now expecting a lot more. They're expecting more from their bank and they're expecting a certain level of service and a certain mm -hmm. access to financial services that just wasn't, you know, wasn't in place even a couple of years ago. So I think, you know, as 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 we think about the the banking sector transforming, I think there's there's a few things to keep in mind. I think so. One is customers are expecting more. I think the second one is, you know, it, Smita talked a bit about API banking and new channels, which I think is so fundamental to to fintech. But what basically what what we're looking at is a change in how banks build products and access customers that is moving away from this vertical integration model where the banks own everything and you can only access a bank product through the branch or maybe through some outdated website or mobile app, right? The new expectations of customers more and more of consumers of SMEs and, and even corporates is I, I as a customer of the bank want to be able to access and interact with the bank's products in a manner that I choose using the pro using the applications that I choose. And if I'm a corporate, that means that it plugs right into my own operation workflow. And if I'm a consumer, that means I should be able to link my bank account to my Bcash app, or I link my, you know, I share my statement data very easily in order to, to access uh, alternative lending as Tillman pointed out. So I think what banks need to realize, and I think are realizing more and more is that to build these new channels and this new infrastructure, it is an entirely new competency. It's an agile way of working. It's new technology that is very different from the legacy kind of core banking vendor led model. Um, and so I think there's a cultural technology and kind of operational change that has to take place. Um, however, there is light at the end of the tunnel because I think what I've seen in Southeast Asia for banks that are willing to adopt a fintech centric approach and adopt partnerships, you know, embrace partnerships with third party fintechs. That means they can do product development faster. That means they can reach customers faster and more efficiently than they could before. And, um, and it puts them in a position to actually compete, you know, even if you're a mid tier or kind of smaller institution it allows you to compete with, with, the large incumbents that may have a larger balance sheet or a or a, a larger branch network. Um, so a lot is changing, and the rate of acceleration is changing. and And it has it really comes down to new technology and also new partnerships uh, between banks and 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 fintechs to build new products and channels. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. So that was a very um, interesting high-level perspective for the macro view. We talked about new technology, we talked about ecosystem, we talked about digital credit, we talked about um, APIs, new channels. So let, now I'd like to take over and do a little bit of a double click and move to the next section where we really wanna focus on um, innovation and technology and how can we accomplish everything that, that all of our panelists have mentioned. To begin with Tillman, um, most people are a little confused and sometimes they think that fintech means digitization. And that's um, a bit of a naive way of looking at fintech. And so my question to you is if you can elaborate and tell us that uh, 
what are some examples of innovation in fintech where it's not just digitizing uh, data? Yeah. <clears throat> no, that, thank you for that question. You know, <clears throat> when you framed that up, it reminded me of how people might have thought about the television when it was invented. They put radio announcers on the television. They didn't leverage the power of the visual, visual medium. And when we invented the internet, uh, the first websites, you, I'm old enough to remember, they were basically brochures on the internet, right? And nobody had figured out how to use the power of, of connectivity. And that's a bit the same with FinTech, right? It's, it's not taking what's today and sort of digitize that. It is really reinventing and making things uh, um, and, and providing services that previously simply weren't feasible. And, and digital credit remains a good example for that, right? There's a large number of smaller enterprises, self-employed people in the economy that would not have been served by traditional banks, but their underlying business is digitizing. And the service providers in that digital world have a good idea of what that business is about. And they can sort of proxy, if you will, the cash flows, and therefore can underwrite an informal sector business that the traditional banks would never have touched. I think the area conceptually where this notion of we can today do things that were just not feasible previously, where the area where that is actually biggest is in insurance, right? In insurance, there were a couple of products, life insurance, because you can underwrite this on the basis of actuarial tables. And then there's a bit mandatory insurance in many countries like car insurance, motor insurance. But there's a lot of stuff, a lot of events in our lives um, that couldn't historically been insured, but it would be very, very helpful to people. The smartphone is my lifeblood. If I can insure against the loss or the damage to my smartphone, that would be very powerful. And those type of innovations are now feasible because insurance can be bite-sized, it can be real-time, it can be embedded in the things that matter for my life. It's not sort of some abstract financial service out there. It's, it's, it's helping me live a better life and improve my economic prospects. And that's what finance should all be all about. And finance is only a means to an end. Digitization is also just a means to an end. And that end is very new, powerful value propositions that improve people's lives. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just a follow on question for you that you've very rightly said that the customer need is not new. The banks and financial institutes know what the customer needs. Um, the, the challenge is finding out the right innovation that will be ad adapted by the customer because, you know, as the fintechs emerge, they're going to be experimenting with lots of new innovative ideas. How the trick will be in saying, how do you know which one will stick, right? What is any comment on that? Well, I think uh, there are a couple of old truths here, which is the first one is people have needs and they behave and you can observe and understand that behavior. And people are very smart, right? If there is a better way of doing things, people will pick up. And uh, sometimes you can develop a hypothesis around that. So um, take mobile money and agent networks it, is, it was far superior to send money, right, the equivalent of cash via the phone from the city to the rural village. It, that was superior, right? It was faster, cheaper, safer. Of course, people embraced that. Uh, sometimes you can hypothesize and develop ideas like that. Most of the time, what you really should do, and that's why we are in the, in, in the business of providing early stage risk equity funding, most of the time you are better off by starting to experiment, see what works, double down on what works, shut down what doesn't work. You still have a hypothesis to start, but you are very empirical and very scientific, if you will, in your approach. 
And in the digital world, that is relatively easy because we can observe all these type of things real time and adjust. So we are at a very exciting time where we can actually help people with far better products and services because we can be informed by real time behaviors, by real time feedback, and we can adjust and tweak accordingly. I let Smitta and Todd bring this to life in the Bangladesh context yes. and in the in no, the, no, in the banking context. Let it to, we will come back back with Smitta and Todd on that. Thank you, Tillman. Um, question for you, Todd. As we've now moved on saying that, yes, um, innovation is required. It's not just digitization. And innovation means, you know, um, you've got to do, spend on technology. And as soon as you spend on technology, there are aspects of cost and there's this other aspect of security. How do you balance the capital cost and the security and the tech innovation when you're trying to uh, do a digital transformation in a financial service sector? Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, that is a, uh, that's basically the question that every CIO or digital bank head at a bank is dealing with right this second. And they're dealing with that because they have a big, huge problem that didn't exist three months ago, right? So three months ago, the economy was humming along. We're on whatever year nine of, 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 of economic growth. Everyone's making massive spending and investment plans and growing their, growing their bank's book, right? And then COVID happens. And now two things become very clear. Number one, all the revenue expectations that these bankers had for 2020 have now there's now a big fat gap because all of that, um, the new loans that were going to be signed, the new account holders they were going to onboard, the new transaction fees that they were going to capture, the M&A deals they were going to capture, all of that went to zero, you know, between March and in, in the case of Philippines, we're basically still on quarantine, right? So they have a massive revenue shortfall. And now they realize that they actually have to invest in digital in a way that they weren't before. And, and so they're faced with a competing task, right? On the one hand, how do we, how do we manage costs super conservatively to, to against the, the revenue shortfall and at the same time invest in digital to enable the fintech and online banking capabilities that are now crystal clear necessary and demanded by customers, right? And I'm sure, I haven't seen the numbers, but I'm sure Bangladesh also saw a massive spike in consumer and SME transaction volumes online. And it's probably safe to say that a lot of Bangladeshis and people all over the world um, basically uh, decided to make the move to online financial services for the first time, whether that's you know, setting up their e-wallet for the first time or, you know, downloading their mobile banking app for the first time because traditional financial services has been so branch centric, right? So anyway, I think as you, uh, you know, for, for, for banks to, to weigh this cost management against investing in digital, I think the answer there, again, I have a biased point of view because I'm a, I'm a fintech that partners with banks, right? But I think the, the right now, the, um, a, 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 sh a shortcut or a, or a hack, if you will, to, to addressing digital innovation while also managing costs is by partnering with fintechs, by providing APIs or other technology that allows connectivity between the bank and the fintech so that the fintech can actually act as an acquiring channel for your bank or driving transaction volume or doing providing credit scoring data back to the bank so that they can make a more informed, lower risk uh, you know, decision. Um, these are things that can actually be done on a revenue share basis, or maybe the FinTech has all the technology out of the box and it's simply a question of access, right? Now, the next question of course is like, well, how do you provide access to the FinTechs in a secure way? And there's a whole you know, long answer I could give about that, but you know, basically the, what makes API technology so powerful is there is there are common agreed standards on what, you know, what an encrypted, you know, end-to-end -end encrypted API is and how you access it and how you manage API uh, traffic back and forth. So they're very like clear rules of the road for how APIs can be used securely to connect a bank to the outside world. 
Um, so anyway, so I guess my, my comment is, you know, as banks are thinking about the need for, for to, to balance technology cost and security, I think the, the first place to look is look at the portfolio of fintechs in your, in your market and think about how they can help you you know, achieve either your revenue goals or your customer acquisition goals in a very short period of time. Yeah, I, I have a follow on question. It's one of my favorite questions because we notice in Bangladesh, we've got 50 plus private banks and they all have IT teams, IT departments. And some of them actually have the sentiment that we can do this ourselves. Um, and so they would start the journey. Um, and, and I'd like you to comment on that. Do you think that a bank should be actually also having its own fintech wing, or does it make sense to leverage from the fintech players that are existing out there and then morph? What is, uh, is there any advice or guidance there? I know it's a trick question, but give us- Yeah, you're asking a dangerous question. Uh, uh, um, I, I'll, I'll give the nice answer. The nice answer is yes, the bank's IT team probably can do it themselves. It's a question of time because the bank's IT team can do it themselves, but they also have 147 other IT projects and they could do it themselves sometime around Q1 2021, right? Assuming that something doesn't get reprioritized, which certainly it will, right? So it's really a question of time because you work with a fintech that can provide an equivalent service and yes, they're a third party and yes, there's risk, da, 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 da. but that fintech can get you live next month. Exactly. So right? it's a matter. And so that's so so it's 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 a question of speed to market. There is another conversation about like what the bank should be managing internally with its IT resources versus what it should be building externally. I think there are. It's tough. It's really tough. I've only seen the in-house development model work at a couple banks um, in the region, and it really takes some leadership that creates a new kind of agile, very kind of modern tech team, separate from the leg. I'll call it the legacy team, which is basically managing the bank infrastructure, right? Managing the core banking system, managing security, extremely important, right? You have to keep the lights on extremely important but it is a different skill set than building out you know the apis and the modern technology to support fintechs to support mobile banking products different skill sets different competencies different ways of working no that's a very good answer a little on the diplomatic side but a very good answer thank you Todd. <laughs> <laughs> okay now smita i have one of an another popular question that a lot of Bangladeshi startups ask and I'm going to ask you that one that, you know, the first mover advantage always is, you know, if you're the first mover, you definitely have this advantage that um, you grab the market, right? It's, it's, um, but then, then what happens is you actually open up ideas and you open up um, avenues for other players to replicate what you've done. And then uh, maybe, you know, someone with a lot of muscle, with a lot of money can come in and do things faster than you. It's, it's about scaling, especially in a country like Bangladesh, right? Um, we're 160 million people, so you've got to scale, otherwise you will never succeed. What is your thought process on how do you prepare wide moats or how do you have barriers to entry when you are first to market or even if you're not first to market, when you're a market leader, you've got the most number of customers. So how do you, what are the wide moats? What are the barriers to entry to protect yourself? Smita. So I would say, uh, uh, first of all, Sonia, if somebody is copying you and, you know, following you, that's the best form of flattery. It means you're doing something well. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, on a more serious note. So, yes, uh, of course, when you when you start doing something well, their market opens up to that idea. And, you know, if you're the first one to do it, you would have probably solved a lot of problems on the way and paved the road for others to follow because uh, uh, so that clearly is uh, um, is one of the uh, things that you have to go through if you're the first one to introduce something truly new and innovative. I would say four things from you know how you can continue to maintain your leadership position. The first thing I would say is really your customer value proposition. 
um, what's your, uh, you know, what's the problem you're solving and what, how uh, relevant is the solution that you're offering and what's the kind of customer engagement that you're getting. I think getting, uh, you know, high traction and getting high uh, engagement from your customers is uh, who can be sticky because you're solving a real problem and your solution works really well. I think your customer stickiness is going to be your biggest moat. Uh, the second thing would be once you've got this product market fit right, it's about scale. You know, how quickly can you capture the market and grow sustainably and, and you know, get a large market share so that, you know, you are ahead of, you know, every new engine that's coming in. Um, the third thing I would say is even once you are uh, after you've got your product market fit right and you have shown growth, I think you have to continuously adapt you have to continuously scan the environment, see what's going on, who are the new competitors coming in, how are the consumers and your customers behaving, what new problems do they have, and you have to continuously reinvent yourself, add new products, add new features, uh, come up with new uh, 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 you know, adjacent solutions so that you can stay ahead of the curve. You cannot let your business remain static. Uh, because the needs and the uh, uh, players are evolving, the market around you is evolving, and you need to continue to evolve itself. The fourth and the last thing I would say is um, funding. You have to be well-funded. You have to continuously attract new capital to continue to sustain that growth. Um, and that would, again, give you a lead over other uh, 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 players. So that's really what is important to continue to maintain a leadership position once you've got your product market fit right. Yeah, so the, the trick, of course, is with the product market fit, right? And, and FinTech is a relatively new um, vertical in Bangladesh. I'm talking in, in uh, Bangladesh's perspective. And I don't think we've seen anyone yet besides the bigger players, the small fintechs, they're all trying to crack the problem, right? No one really has uh, had that eureka or aha moment. So in this market, it's, it's kind of everybody's swimming with the sharks and see who wins. What advice would you give to startups that are working with MSMEs, which is the, that, uh, the middle that you talked about that are too small for banks and too big for MFIs? What two things could they do to make sure that they serve uh, a, a customer base that is not very tech savvy, a customer base that is not also very educated or, or sophisticated with the fintech tools that we are talking about. What could they be doing? Yeah, so actually that's a very intuitive process. I would say that the first step is to take a customer first approach, which is, you know, decide who is your target customer that you want to serve. And let's take an example. It's at the small merchants, uh, you know, the, uh, the Moody Dukans, or, you know, let me take the example of Shop Up, uh, uh, you know, which I invested in. So their focus, their starting point was that there are so many online Facebook sellers. And let me try and understand what are the problems that these uh, sellers face. So that as, as they started to understand, there's a whole lot of people who are on Facebook, but many of them are actually just have a shop and they don't act, make any transactions and they don't actually sell. And let's understand what is the problem. And they understood that, hey, they have a problem in, in marketing online. They don't understand how to market online. They, don't, they have a problem with the logistics. Once they get an order, how do they get the delivery to the buyer? Uh, they have a problem in collecting the sales proceeds. So they understood, hey, these are three or four problems that need to be solved. How can I actually give them a solution that solves these problems? And as you start offering that, you will get to see based on the customer feedback whether that's working or not. So another example, you know, when you, you, uh, uh, you ask, Todd, can the banks do it all themselves or do they need fintech? Of course, at one level, the banks can do it all themselves. And let me give you an example. A mobile banking app, 
if you have an app of, uh, for banking, how you and I would use it would be very different from how a small merchant would want to use it, would be very different from how a cab driver uh, would want to use it. And it would be even more different if you have a, a, you know, somebody uh, um, in the rural area who would be using it. I think what is important is to attune all of that, contextualize it for the customer segment that you're serving. So for a small merchant, if you just offer a standalone payment facility, hey, start taking all your payments from customers in, uh, you know, uh, in digital, it won't work because it's not part of the business process flow of that merchant. But if you give a solution which combines Finds invoicing and digital payments, then it starts to make a lot of sense. As I'm issuing an invoice, it's also kind of uh, uh, allowing me to make a digital payment. If you allow, if you combine bookkeeping and invoicing and digital payments for a small merchant, that's a huge aha moment for the merchant, and it can create a big traction uh, for the fintech solution. So I think what is necessary is focus on the customer customer, understand the context and the needs of the customer, and then come up with a really creative tech first solution. And the second thing I would say is continue to listen to your customers because your customers are the best ones to give you honest feedback and you can get some fantastic ideas from that feedback that you get. Perfect. Thank you very much. Now that takes us to the Final part of our, our um, section, we began with macro, then we discussed innovation and technology, and now it's going to be all about startups. Uh, for everyone who's listening, a reminder that this is a, a webinar about fintech in a less contact world from a venture capitalist perspective, people who are funding fintech startups. So we don't have startups here for a reason because they are the recipients. We, we're looking at an investor's lens and that's what we're trying to share with you. I think there's been a few questions on that. So I'm hoping I'm addressing that because we're looking at investor lens. Um, I will take uh, this question um, is for you, Tillman, because you funded many startups in fintech. Can you share with us, um, you know, some of the, the, what, some of the startups that have worked on innovation and they've stimulated a, a very good ecosystem uh, that promotes innovation. Um, if you can, if, if I've been able to explain my question. So give us some examples from your experience as a venture capital funding fintechs that are very good examples that we could learn from. Hmm. So I'm not sure I've fully understand the question in terms of the ecosystem building effect, but maybe we can explore that. But <clears throat> in terms of, um, of, of startups that we have funded, um, so we, 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 what we try to do is develop a view of where are areas <clears throat> in, in the current system that have inefficiencies that don't address consumer needs and where tech-led innovation could make a big difference and sort of and, and, and capturing a lot of what Smitter said in her previous answer, right? Where can we, where is a value proposition that's feasible, uh, that is a win-win for the consumer and, and, and for the new services provider? Um, and we have We've done that in digital credit, we have done it in insure tech, we have done it in rec tech. One example that has worked quite well, um, and it's not quite arrived in Asia yet, from an ecosystem replication effect perspective, which might be addressing part of the underlying question, is this entire theme of challenger banks. <clears throat> so in the US, right, um, there was a customer segment millennials who came of age during the financial crisis of 2008-2009. They didn't have access to credit cards. They used debit and the current account as their primary spending vehicle. And they really didn't like traditional banks. They rather all these surveys that say people rather go to the dentist than to a traditional bank. They wanted an experience for their main banking needs that is similar to the experience they had with Spotify for music and with whatever it may be, right, Uber and in logistics and right, uh, right hailing. 
So neobanks popped up that understood that and they provided a service that's great and it's free. There was also a question in the Q&A that I saw on the screen asking about fees that financial, digital financial services providers may charge. And I don't know what the situation in Bangladesh is, but what we are seeing worldwide typically is with the innovation, with the entrance of new players and scale, the traditional fee structure of the incumbent systems come under pressure. Though the challenger banks in the US, they provide a free account with no overdraft fees or any of these other punitive ways that traditional banks are trying to make money. And they can do that because they have such a lower cost structure and they have all the information, they can live off the debit card interchange fee in the US, which is relatively higher than in other countries. So this model might not work everywhere, but, but you see that new approaches with a value proposition that works uh, are scalable. And when you have these type of things, others follow suit. And frankly, the entire incumbent industry structure starts will start reacting as well. And that's the type of broader ecosystem systems change that we would love to accelerate. I don't know whether this went to the gist of your question, Sonia, so apologies if it didn't but there is some sort of logic around, we can create the entrepreneurs that we invest in. We want them to be very, very successful in their own right. But we also want them to create a demonstration effect that better, cheaper, more adequate services are feasible so that others will adopt this. Well, that, that's really helpful. That, that actually helps. Um, thank you. I will take, um, I will extend this question to Todd and saying that Todd you you have looked at the other piece right where you're enabling and empowering banks to to digital uh, for the digital transformation journey so what can we do in Bangladesh Todd from from your lens from your perspective and your experience with with the Southeast Asia and ASEAN market um. So I, my, my, my response to that is similar to, you know, kind of building on what Tillman has said. Saul, so, and I think, look, like, like we've seen, especially in, in, in FinTech, we've seen incredible transformation with the infrastructure layer of UPI and the Aadhaar and the, the, that, that kind of layer in India. So that, I mean, that's really the, in terms of emerging market fintech, that is really the kind of use case, right? For or not use case, but a, a example of what a, an enabling environment can do. My answer to your question is like, I think that entrepreneur, so in fintech, which is the world I live in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a market like Bangladesh, I think there's a way, to, so you can, you can take an approach of like saying, hey, I want to solve this particular problem, right? Like there's, you know, there's not a, like agricultural credit is still inefficient and we want to, let's, let's find a better way to deliver a low cost credit to, to, you know, to farmers, right? Very specific solution. Or you could think about, you know, you could go one level lower and say, man, it's so early days for fintech in a market like Bangladesh. There's so much to improve, so much to build. Can we be an, like an, can we build, build a layer that allows others to build fintechs in a much faster way, right? And then as, as Smita was saying, then when you're addressing the problem of a merchant that needs an invoicing and a payment solution, there's someone that can very bit quickly assemble the pieces who really knows that particular customer's problem and assemble the pieces together and immediately deliver a fintech app to a very specific customer type to solve some of their, their financial services challenges, right? Whereas today, like without that infrastructure layer, you're, you know, and you want to build a fintech solution, you're knocking on the door of as many partner banks as it takes in order to get your first, you know, kind of partnership to market, right, in many cases. So I guess the way I'd answer that is, yes, of course, go after problems that are that you're passionate about and that you really want to solve, but also think about 
you know, kind of the, the layer, the, the more foundational layer, which is how do I make it easier for a hundred different fintechs to take off three or four years from now, because I've solved a connectivity problem that allows them to start tomorrow, right? And just the, the, the very simple example of this, it's a bit of a, you know, a developed world example, developed world example but it's, it's, it's really the, the kind of the global example right now is, is what Stripe has done for credit card payments, right? So prior to Stripe, a startup needed to have a payments team, right? And that payment team is negotiating with credit card processors and then going through months of integration and it's a massive pain and the documentation sucks. And it's like, these are IT developers for your early stage startup. Payment, getting paid from your customers is, is an extremely important part of the startup. And these are developers that are not working on product, but they're actually just working with these old school payment processors. And now you integrate with Stripe or someone else. It's a junior developer half day of work. And now you move on to building product, right? So that's, an, that's one example in FinTech of like taking something that was a problem, but that actually unlocked uh, resources for, you know, a whole generation of startups to follow. So that would be my encouragement for, for, for the Bangladeshi community in FinTech. Perfect. That, that's actually a good answer. We'll come back to you. There's a follow on question I've had, but I'll come back to you, Todd. I'm going to go to Smita and this is the crux of today's um, webinar. Smita, what are you looking for to fund a startup, a fintech startup in Bangladesh? So first and, of all, I would, go ahead. Well, and of course, please comment on the appetite for funding fintech startups in Bangladesh from Flourish point of view. Yeah, as I think Tillman has already said, our commitment to fintech globally is very high, including Bangladesh. So we would love to see more exciting business models coming out of Bangladesh that we can fund. Um, having said that, let me, let me break down how we look at the investment decision and what is it that we're looking for. I think there are, it's, it's broken up into three parts. So the first part is what's, the core, what's your core business? and which is really questions around um, who's the customer you're serving, what's the problem you're solving for, and how unique and innovative is the solution, why your solution is the best one to have. So that's the you know, first la layer around your business model and what are you doing. The second layer is really around the macro environment. How big is the market? What's the target addressable market? What's the ecosystem like? Are there tailwinds in the form of uh, regulation, policy, or partnerships with other players that would give you uh, an impetus? So that's the macro picture as to where does your solution fit in the context of the overall market and how positive is the entire market and the ecosystem for you? So an example for that would be so if, you're, if you are looking at uh, um, B2B payments, you know, coming up with a solution around, you know, solving digital payments for small businesses. So then it's not just, so the first layer is going to be how, what's your solution and how unique it is and all of that. The second layer is going to be what's going on in the market. How many small businesses are there in Bangladesh? Who all could be, would this uh, 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 solution be relevant to? Who are the other players who are offering something similar? Who are the banks you could partner with? What is the policy and the regulation framework under which you will operate and how conducive it is for your business model? And the third layer is really going to be around the evaluation of the founders and the team. Uh, you know, what are the qualities that the founders bring? You really need to, to be a startup founder. You need to have a lot of grit, perseverance, uh, conviction around what you want to build, a huge amount of passion, uh, apart from, of course, domain expertise in what you're trying to do, your ability to think creatively and out of the box. So I would really say that the evaluation of an investment decision is around these three axes, your core business, your macro environment, and the founder's evaluation. Um, I, I would like you to comment because you've funded quite a few fintechs, right? So this is, um, I've asked this before, but this question has come up many times in, in my feed, so I'm asking you this. Um, it's not really tested, right? 
nothing is really tested or proven, especially in a market like Bangladesh. So you're taking a bet in a way. Um, how do you as an investor know what is the other things besides these three? Because there's always a risk of a startup not making it, right? Because they're dealing with a market where the customer has unarticulated needs, not only unmet, but unarticulated. How as an investor from Flourish's view, do you factor in some kind of a, you know, formula which is beyond the three that you mentioned, which are just very mathematical and scientific, right? There, there has to be some kind of an art. What is that? So I'm glad you're asking that, Sonia. Um, we do make investments at seed stage. And when I say seed stage is when you haven't yet got your product market fit proven, or uh, you haven't actually started seeing uh, you know, revenue or traction flowing. So it's really, in those cases, we are really betting on the idea and whether the idea would work. And in that case, I think you know, the order reverses. Number one, I think the founder and the team becomes really important. Who's the founder? What is the founder? Uh, where is the founder coming from? What's the conviction and the passion? So that becomes super uh, critical. The next piece of the thing is you still have to understand what is the solution? Who are you addressing it? And why are there reasons why it, it could work? We could draw parallels from other markets where it has worked we could be looking at the current context to see how big is the pain point and is this really going to address there are pilots that one could go by uh, and at the end of the day as a seed investor before making an in, uh, you know before the business comes live there is a risk that as an investor we take yes there is a possibility it may work or it may not work but at that point of time when we are making the investment we are making our best guess based on the available information of whether is this likely to work uh, based on conversations of the mar uh, of, with consumers looking at what is the potential uh, solution you're offering, what's the tech behind it. And, you know, uh, that's how we arrive at that decision. And so it's not necessary that investors always only come in when the product market fit is established or where there is revenue already showing or where there is you know high growth so those so there are investors who come in at different stage so you have the angel investors who would come in when you probably just have a powerpoint presentation and nothing else uh, uh, there are seed stage investors who come in when there is you know a bit more uh, uh, you know structure around the entire business model and then there are the, later growth stage investors who come in once you have already started to get significant traction and they come in to funnel and fund your growth to the next stage. So there are different profiles of investors who look for different things at different stages. Thank you. That's actually very useful because we've got uh, fintechs that are at, at you know concept stage. There are some that already have some kind of a pilot. So this was a useful answer. We're, we're almost towards the end of the show. So I'm going to go back to each one of you. And um, as you know, Bangladesh is uh, right now, our GDP is about 275 billion. We expect it to be 750 billion in 20, 30, in 10 years from now. So we're expecting huge growth and momentum. Uh, we expect FinTech as one of the verticals to actually explode. Um, and that's, a, uh, that's using it in a positive way. And then, um, you know, the digital transformation that has happened specifically in fintech in the last three months would have actually taken three years had COVID not happened. So that, that, that morphing has happened. Um, as closing remarks from each one of you, we'll begin with Tillman um, and then Todd and then Smita. So Tillman, if you want to give a closing remark, a one minute remark to the founders of fintech who are looking to get funded, what would be something you would want to share with them? Yeah, I, um, listen, I, I share the, the positive outlook, right? Bangladesh is a young country, it's a big country, it's a growing country. And at the macro level, the financial sector is always one that sort of takes off and leads economic growth, actually, somewhat disproportionately. In a certain, at a certain inflection point, if you look at the economic development of many countries, you will see that. So anybody who's exploring um, financial services 
uh, is, is in a good space. And FinTech is a particularly good space for all the reasons we discussed earlier, <clears throat> because it has this potential to create totally new value propositions and reach far more people at, at far lower cost. What you must not lose sight of are the things that, that Smitter described, her three buckets, so to speak, and then translate them into your context, right? So what is this value proposition and why is it plausible? What are the assumptions that are underlying your business idea and model? And how can you create everybody's comfort around those assumptions? And as you then start the journey, are you measuring the right things so that you know whether your assumptions are actually true or not. And then do you have the wherewithal to, as they call it, pivot when an original assumption turned out to be wrong and you therefore need to try different things. So, so right, I, 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 I do think that a lot of what we do is, is as much art as it is science and common sense goes a long way don't get trapped by jargon and all that type of stuff. But if you do something that is truly, truly valuable to the people that you want to help, your customers will come. And if you have a business model that has what they call, or what we call positive unit economics, right? So on every single customer, ultimately, um, uh, you can cover your cost and some, then your business will take off. So the fundamentals need to be right. Uh, it's not fluff and marketing and that type of stuff, right. at least not with us as an investor. Thank you. That's a very good answer. And I'm hoping our, our um, founders and fintech startups have heard that and made note that it is actually not about fluff. It's about positive unit economics and it's about traction. Right? Thank you, Tilden. Um, Todd, we just talked about the transformation and then the morphing. And the word pivot has been so operational in VC lingo. We'd like you to talk about it from your perspective as when you work with banks and then you've said the digital transformation, the middle between banks and fintech. The, a lot of people have said that if you've had a business plan before March, reevaluate and, and, and recalibrate. So if you can comment on the pivoting that is happening and what advice would you give to startups that are in that mode, that they had a plan and that's changed especially fintech startups uh well for a uh, for a lot of fintech startups it's it's acceleration not pivoting right for a lot of them um now if you're in consumer credit or certain sectors that are directly impacted okay there's there's going to be some challenges right um but there are a number if you know if, if you kind of categorize out the fintech sectors many of them are experiencing acceleration now, maybe that's acceleration because their volumes have exploded and now they have new new problems because <laughs> their systems, their IT is breaking um, or, you know, but, but uh, you know, it, or it could be um, acceleration in terms of demand and that demand may come from um, kind of unexpected places, right? And I think just to give you an example, uh, you know, as we talk to, as we talk to potential and existing bank partners, um, for our API technology, I think the the conversation pre-March, so we haven't necessarily pivoted, but the messaging and the narrative has changed a lot it, just in the last few 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 months. It changed from a investment building capabilities, which is basically a cost point of view, right? Uh, for the banks, right? Okay, we need to build new cap digital capabilities. We need to build new, build new, kind of a, a new way of delivering technology. That conversation now takes place entirely in the context of revenue generation, right? So it's not investing in capabilities anymore. It is how can Broncos or how can another fintech work with you as a bank to unlock a new source of transaction fee revenue or interest revenue from a new loan origination product um, tomorrow, right? So. I think I, I, I point that out because pivoting is not always dropping an old dropping your product A and shifting to product B, although every single startup will will do that um, many times. And that's good because that means you're finding, you know, finding your path. Right. Um, but pivoting can also mean a change in your, 
your narrative by reflecting how customers and partners are reacting and what matters to them, right? Um, so I think the, the, the message is to be open-minded with your partners, with your customers, with your, you know, with your ecosystem building counterparts um, to be kind of flexible enough to let go of the old message and embrace the new message, right? That's a great answer. Thank you. And now, Smita, um, your advice to startups that are starting their journey in fintech, A, two, we need two comments from you. One is for those who are just starting, who have realized fintech is going to be, uh, has a great future. And second, those fintech that are already operating, they are, uh, they are in the market and let's say they, they approached Flourish. So from a venture capitalist point of view, you're a global investment advisor, what would your advice be for startups starting their journey and startups already in traction? So for the startups who are just getting started, my advice would be uh, find the customer, find the problem and find the solution. Don't do it the other way around. Hey, I have built this incredible product that I love. Now let me go and find people who will be willing to buy it. Don't do that. Start the other way around with the customer first. Um, for the people who are already running a fintech business, my advice would be think of your revenue model and your business model really carefully. You know, you don't want to overcharge uh, your customers so that you don't get traction. I think the, you know, what Todd said was really important. You, you need to think of ways of having a win-win model for all your stakeholders. Your customer is a stakeholder, a bank partner could be your stakeholder, a distribution partner could be your stakeholder. You have to find a way that there is something in it for each one of them. It, you have to give them a way to increase income, increase revenue, increase sales, and then you're taking a share of that enhanced revenue or enhanced uh, 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 income rather than you offering a solution that ends up becoming a cost center for the other person. Uh, and therefore it's all about, hey, it's too expensive and therefore let me not use it. If you go and tell a merchant, you have to pay 2% or 3% if you want to move, do a digital payment versus doing in cash. Well, why should I move away from cash? Life is good for me in cash and I will continue to do that. You have to think about what's the problem you're solving for them What's the incremental revenue or income you're generating for them and then charge your revenue based on that. So I think getting the right business model, also thinking through what you want to offer free and what you want to charge for. That becomes really important to get customer engagement and customer stickiness. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're, we're out of time, so I'm going to summarize really quickly. We've, we've heard our panelists, and um, I won't do justice to everything they've said. I'm going to try to do it as fast as I can. So firstly, you build an ecosystem. It's, a, it's not just about digitization. It's about innovation. It's, it's about digital credit, thinking of new ways of avenues, APIs, QR codes, looking at the missing middle, those that are too big for um, MFIs, too small for banks, the, the, the digital inclusion, and then obviously working with banks and seeing how can you accelerate the transformation with innovation faster. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tillman. Thank you, Smita. And thank you, Todd. This was a great informative session. And all the startups that are listening, this was for you from a venture capitalist point of view and what they are thinking. So we hope that a lot of Bangladeshis will be applying and talking to Flourish and Brancas. And let's see, um, hope for some good traction. Thank you, everyone. And good night.